Let's hit the dance floor. Don't work too hard, my break a backbone. Return to the Mac, the king is back though. Corvette and cash, I never lack those. She saw the stone, you know how that go. Fatality, my diamonds that cold. Versace trunks, I hit my backstroke. Knock on the door. She at the back, bro. Welcome to Houdini is Hip. This is a brand new beginner tutorial series for Houdini. So this is a revised version of Houdini Isn't Scary, which was a complete beginner's introduction to Houdini. However, that is now outdated and there were a lot of things that we didn't exactly cover. So this series is going to be showing you not just the general 3D kind of workflow in Houdini, but also how to integrate that with live action so you can use it on your own indie work and you can kind of understand how it works in television and film. So you don't need to know Houdini to get into this. From the beginning, we're going to be going into navigation and installation of Houdini, and then we're going to be moving on to basic 3D understandings, and then we're going to be going into all of the fun stuff, so the dynamic things. So we're going to be looking at things like pops, vellum, pyro, flip, all of it, right? We're going into all of the dynamic stuff in a beginner capacity. So in this part, we're just going to be looking at what Houdini is, how it's used, and a sort of general 3D pipeline, just so that you understand how 3D works. So even if you don't really understand 3D, CG, VFX, all of those weird terms, even if you don't understand all of that, you can still kind of use this tutorial series and gain some knowledge from it and use that knowledge. So to start with, what are all those weird terms? Well, let's start with CG. So CGI, is computer generated imagery and this spans a wide range of things from 2d to 3d it's as the name suggests any sort of imagery that is generated on a computer so it's not live action where live action would be an actual recording so you take a physical camera and you record a scene that would be live action cgi would be completely computer generated now when we say something is full cg that's what we mean we mean that it is entirely computer generated and there is no live action elements to it we can think of something like Shrek, where the entire film is made on a computer, right? There's no actual actors and there's no actual recorded elements. The entire thing is generated on a computer. Now, this is slightly different to VFX. VFX is somewhat of a subset of CGI in that when we look at VFX, it may be a CGI element. So we have a CGI element and we're adding it to a live action plate. Now, to give you an idea of how that actually works, we're going to be looking at the VFX pipeline. Now, when I say pipeline, that basically just means what the process is for generating an entire VFX shot. So from start to finish. Now, there are a couple of steps to that. And now generally, when we look at pipelines, we're going to be looking at different types of software. We're going to be looking at different types of roles. So you might not do the entire pipeline yourself. You may be working in a studio where someone does one part and you do another part, but we're going to be showing you the entire pipeline just so that you can understand how VFX works. So to start with, we have this live action recording and that's the first step, right? You take your camera and you record a live action plate. Now, there are some things that you have to take into consideration. For example, these are a list of things that we had to take into consideration for this shot. The reason that you have to take those things into consideration is because they get used later on when you're recreating the scene in 3D, right? So if you want to add an element, you have to have almost a replica of the actual environment so that you can add those elements to your scene. This brings us onto the next part, replicating the physical camera. So generally, this is what is called camera tracking or even object tracking. So this is where you would match the movement of the physical camera and create a virtual camera. This allows you to create a 3D scene that matches your physical camera and you can add elements in and all of the movements match. In our case, it's very straightforward. We don't have any camera move or anything, so it's really simple. However, you should still keep track of things like focal lengths and frame rates. All of those things become important. So this brings us on to the next step. And this is where we actually get into 3D. So the first step is actually creating a 3D model. This is assuming that we're going to be doing something with a 3D model as opposed to simulations. We'll talk about simulations a little bit later. So let's go ahead and add a 3D model to our scene. So we're just going to add this 3D model over here. And at the moment, it doesn't really look like much, but when we create this model, we'll be using some sort of modeling software to create it. That could be Blender, Houdini, Maya. There's a bunch of software options for creating a 3D model. This brings us onto the next step, which is adding materials. So at the moment, this object doesn't have any materials, but in real life, everything has some sort of material. There is some sort of characteristic to its appearance, right? So an object might have a certain roughness or it might be metal or it might be glass, right? So we need to add those characteristics to our model. 
And the way that we go about doing that is by generating textures and creating materials and then applying it. So we can go ahead and add a material to our object and it'll now look like this. Now you have a couple of options for creating textures and for creating materials. So in this case, you'll be using software such as Substance Painter, Mari, or even something like Blender or Houdini. You can do what's called procedural texturing. And again, we'll be getting into that a bit later, but do understand that there's a lot of ways to do these types of things. Next, we'll be looking at lighting. So at the moment, this doesn't really fit into our scene, and that's because it doesn't really match in terms of lighting. It might have the same material, but the important element in matching it to our actual environment is matching the lighting. So we have this light over here, that light over there, and a light in the background, as well as some ambient light. So let's go ahead and add those lights. So if we have this object and we go ahead and we can add this light over here, then we can go ahead and add that light over there. And finally, we'll add any sort of ambient light. So now you'll notice that it fits into the scene a lot better. So that step over there where we're lighting is again done in whatever software we've decided to render our scene in. So that brings us onto rendering. So rendering is the idea of taking our 3D scene and basically taking a picture of it or a video, right? So it's the same concept as taking your phone into the real world where everything's 3D, taking a picture, and now you have a 2D representation of the 3D world. So that's what we're doing in the 3D software. We're taking a fake virtual camera in our fake 3D scene, and we're capturing a 2D image. And that 2D image is our render. Now, again, rendering can be done in many software packages. So this could be something like Blender, Maya, Houdini, whatever it is, you can use many different types of software for rendering. Additionally, there are different render engines. So a render engine is an add-on for a particular piece of software that allows you to compute a render, right? So it takes everything into consideration, such as your materials and lighting and generates an image for you or a render. Now, there are different types of render engines and a lot of them are used interchangeably between different software packages because they have third party functionality. So if we're looking at something like Maya, it might have Arnold as its renderer, but then again, you can use Arnold in Houdini to render. So you do have options like that. Once you have your image that has been rendered out, we're going to be looking at compositing. This is where we take our render and whatever render layers we may have, and we compile them all together with our original live action plate. Now there's a lot of steps to compositing, but the intention behind compositing is to integrate your VFX elements or your renders with your live action plate as best as possible. Now this might mean including things like glow or you know fancy kind of post-processing like lens flare, but it can also be something simple like color grading. So in this step, you'll generally just be taking your renders, you'll be adding it to your live action plate, and you'll be doing a bunch of different things to try and get them to match as closely as possible. Now, when it comes to compositing, again, you have a lot of options for the software that you can use. The industry standards are generally Nuke and Resolve. You can also use Blender and Houdini also does have functionality for compositing. So once you've done that, you now have an element that's in your scene on your live action plate that hopefully <laughs> fits in with the rest of the scene as well as possible. So that's what we have in this case over here. We've done everything that we can to try and get it to match the environment that we're in as best as possible. Now, this doesn't mean that you're only limited to an object, right? As I said earlier, you could have a simulation. Simulations are where we use a piece of software to compute or replicate real world physics. So if we think of some water splashing, there's a lot of physics that go into how that water interacts. There's things like surface tension and there's things like viscosity and vorticity and all sorts of things that actually define how that water interacts with objects and how it actually operates as a fluid. Now, in that case, we're looking at fluid dynamics. And when we're looking at dynamics, Houdini is the industry standard for simulation VFX. So chances are, if you've seen something like a tsunami in a movie or a building collapsing or some sort of fire or smoke, chances are it was made with Houdini. Houdini is the industry standard for creating those types of effects. However, Houdini isn't only limited to creating those effects. For example, it's also extremely well known for proceduralism. Now proceduralism is the idea that you can create something with a set of rules. So instead of actually modeling a building where we have to create each wall and we have to place a window over here and a door over here, and we have to do all sorts of things manually by hand only to end up with a single building, what we can do with proceduralism is that we can create a set of rules. We can say, okay, 
we have this many walls, and if a wall is this long, it has this many windows at this particular height, and it has a door in certain areas. And then what you can do is just infinitely generate buildings based on that set of rules. Now, proceduralism is incredibly powerful, and it is one of the reasons why Houdini is considered a more complex piece of software. That brings me on to the reason why Houdini isn't scary as a series in the first place. There's a very common perception that Houdini is a scary piece of software. However, when we look at it for what it is, it needs to be a fairly complex piece of software. For example, we're dealing with a lot of physics and simulation based effects. And so there's a lot of elements that we need to understand, right? Over and above that, if we're working with proceduralism, it isn't as straightforward as just creating a 3D model. We're now working with sets of rules and all sorts of interconnected functions to generate things in a different way. It takes a bit of a different type of mindset and a different understanding and framing to really understand Houdini. However, it is an incredible piece of software. For example, we've been using Houdini now for the last five years, and at no point have we felt limited on a project. Prior to that, we were using Blender, and Blender is an incredible piece of software, don't get me wrong. I do think that it has a place in many people's pipelines, especially indie studios and smaller studios, and even now it's bleeding into larger studios. However, I do find that there are some limitations to it, and if you really want to up your game, I feel like you should at least have a base level understanding of Houdini so that you know where it can be used and how it can really help you expand what's possible in your work. There's many a time where I've finished with a Houdini project and I'm literally just amazed at how much it could handle, right? Whether that's from a simulation or insane levels of instancing massive amounts of trees onto huge terrains. There's so many cool things that you can do with Houdini. And so I hope that this series that we're delving into now helps you understand Houdini. And so in the next part, we're going to be looking at how to actually install Houdini and get started with it. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye. So a render engine is the set of... So a render engine is... <laughs> Join in with this. This is going to be a bit different. We're doing things a bit differently this time. Ah. <laughs>